house this morning. What a great yeah. looking bunch y'all are. Yeah. Amen. Sure. We're glad you're here. Make sure you bring some folks with you next week. This side sure is. Last week it was this side that was all falling. <laughs> this side was kind of, this side, I don't know if something's wrong with you, Brother Chris, or what the deal is. Nobody seems to want to sit by you and Sister Deborah over there. I, I, I don't know. I feel the church coming in falling this part. <laughs> Praise God. God sure is up to some great things at Gateway of Hope, and so glad that God's brought us to where he has, and just can't imagine Amen. where we are headed. My goodness, Amen. eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it even entered into the heart of man what God has in store for those that love him Amen. and diligently seek him, is what it says. And so that's what we want to talk about this morning. What does it mean to diligently seek the Lord? You know, we mentioned last week out of, uh, out of the book of Job, the necessity for God's people to pray. And the passage there said that we were to come to him with, with prayer, with fasting. I know we got really shut on that fasting part. With weeping and with mourning. And that we were not to tear our clothes, but instead we should tear our hearts. And that we should lay ourselves open and bare before God. And that if we would do those things, then later on in the chapter he says, If you'll do all of these things, then... I will see to it that your threshing floors will be full, that your presses will overflow with new wine and with oil. And we sure want the if, don't we, Sister Ferris? Sometimes? We want the, we don't want the if, we want the then. That's what we want. We want the wine presses to be full. We want the oil to flow. We want the threshing floor to be full. But there's not a whole lot of times that we're too thrilled about that if part. But it's an if and then. It is a causal relationship. And the if is not a really very hard if. As a matter of fact, he does all the work. All we do is simply submit to what it is that he's wanting to do. Because I don't want us to get the idea that somehow that by our doing anything that we earn God's favor or God's mercy or that he looks at us and he goes, oh yeah, they've done enough now. No, all he says, if you but just start to do what I've asked you to do, I'll take care of everything Hallelujah. from that point forth. Grace, yes. unspeakable. Yes. It is a, it is an, it's an amazing and abundant grace. But I want us to, to go to, if we're going to learn how to pray the way the New Testament church prayed, we should probably go check out the guy who started the New Testament church and see what he had to say, I don't know, about prayer. What do you think, Ken? It's a pretty good plan. Let's see what... Let's see what the guy who started the church had to say about prayer. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew. Matthew, the seventh chapter, uh, and we're going to start with the seventh verse. As a matter of fact, actually, actually Matthew 6, sorry, Matthew 6, starting with the seventh verse. And uh, this, is, this is the Lord's Prayer, as it's often called. However, this really isn't the Lord's Prayer. This should be the disciples' prayer. Right. And we are the disciples. So let's see what Jesus had to say about prayer. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that that is all the reward that they will ever get. But when you pray, go behind your, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private, private then your Father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think that their prayers are answered merely by repeating words over and over again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need before you even ask Him. Therefore, pray like this. Would you read this with me? Our Father in heaven, May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. And forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. For the kingdom, power, and glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. Now, of course... We learned it 
a little differently. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. A lot of churches love to repeat that prayer. They love it. And, and you'll go to church, and they'll say the prayer a hundred times. I remember there was, a, there, was a, there was a TV channel, EWTN, and every now and then I'll, I'll catch it on there, and there's, a, there's some nuns that pray on there, and they just repeat this over for an hour. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed. And after a while, you just kind of go like, Jesus said, don't pray that way. This is, he, after he says, don't keep repeating the same things over and over and over again, he then gives us a prayer, and people have completely ignored what he said just prior to the prayer, where he says, don't repeat the same thing over and over again, and then they repeat the same thing over and over again. You see, there's a couple of things I want us to learn today, and I want us to study this prayer, and I'm going to talk about through this prayer for the next week, maybe two weeks, it might go three, depends on how far we get along here. First of all, before we really get into the prayer, we mentioned last week there is a need to pray. First of all, we can't survive unless we pray. Not as believers. Now, you can go ahead and do a lot of things on your own. You can, uh, you, you can do many things on your own, but to live a victorious For the Christian road life, that you leads from do darkness into light. In prayer. And without before God, for the hope that rescues us day, from day, endless of having night. a devoted time where you pray. And that for the grace that, that covers sin at the door where, where life begins, for salvation or reaching or in exactly to guide us through. The door as fast as you can. Thanks be to For the healing that no mortal can explain. They don't pray. And they have a lot of For deliverance that breaks the sinner's chain. For the strength to carry on. And forgiveness great and strong. And the promise of your mercies ever new. Thanks be to our God. Hallelujah. Everlasting songs will rise for all you've done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. that cries out to be filled. What is wrong with those people? I mean, they go For the promise that your word is deeper still. For the longing and the need to have more of you in me. Because nothing satisfies the way you do. Thanks be to Everlasting songs will rise 
because one of the most uh, urgent roles that needs to be filled in the lives of children is that, is that father figure, and our society has pretty much abdicated the role of fatherhood. And I think that is a travesty, and I, you can actually pinpoint back into our society, and you can look at the problems that we have. It is because kids no longer have the role models of what a father is Amen. to be. Amen. And that's a very sad, sad thing. Fathers in our society are absent. Fathers in our society uh, aren't there. They just go out and they think it's time that you know, all their duty is to is to earn the paycheck to make sure there's food in the house, or but they're not there to nurture those children. But fathers in, in Middle Eastern society are very, very different. The father is the core of the home. As a matter of fact, when you read Paul's writings on the home and how the family was to be ordered, there was a reason in Middle Eastern society that the father, the man was the head of the household, not that everybody else had to cower in fear underneath the husband or underneath the father, but that God's blessing would flow down through the hierarchy of the family. And that's the same way it works in our relationship with God. The things which we receive from Jesus come through the Father. The Father brings them to us. And there is a very special role the Father has. You see, the relationship that we have with our fathers in Western society is nothing like that. It's a very gentle relationship. And no matter what, it cannot be broken. It cannot be broken. Look with me, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him you have all, in him you also, in him you also, why don't you put that up on the screen? There we go. Now, you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he <laughs> promised that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we could praise and glorify him. You see, God, once he has adopted you and given you the spirit of adoption whereby you can call him Abba or Daddy Father, he is not going to terminate your children's rights. You are not going to be kicked back out of the family. The way the Word teaches is when you know Him, and when you are in Him, no one can take you out of His hand. Amen. You are secure. And folks who believe otherwise, let me just make it very clear. The idea that you can lose your salvation, the idea that if I'm not holy enough, the idea that if I don't do all of the things, and if I don't tithe every last penny, and if I'm not in church every time the doors are open, and if I don't do this right, or if I do that, then I will lose my salvation, is not supported by this book. Amen. This book teaches grace. And that is not grace, folks. That is grace mixed with law. And grace mixed with law is like very clean water with just a little bit of dirt in it. How much of that do you want? I don't believe at all that God would go through such great lengths to bring you into his family just to kick you out of the drop of a hat. Yes. As a matter of fact, the word says, the parable of the prodigal son, even when he was the prodigal son, he was still the prodigal son. He was not the prodigal ex-son. And the father was waiting for him to come. Jesus said, if a shepherd has 99, has 100 sheep, and one goes off, I'll go out and I'll find that sheep and bring it back. That's the great extent. So we have a relationship, and I can praise God that today my relationship with God is secure. So when I pray, my Father who is in heaven, then I know that I have a very special relationship with him. And no matter what the enemy says, no matter what the world says, no matter what the general council of the assemblies of God say, Amen. no matter what anybody says, my relationship with him is through him. It's not through those people. I'm, you can wait till the cows come home for them to give you their blessing. 
they might, that's all great and good, but I don't need your blessing or anybody else's blessing. I just need him to say, well done. You're my child. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Our relationship with God is secure. The role of grace is that, that by grace we are saved, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you cannot take the credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. So when we get ready to get on our knees and we are praying and we say, our Father who is in heaven, it should be a reminder to us of his amazing grace that he has saved us by, whereby we have been made sons and daughters of God. Excuse me. That would have been a good point to say amen. 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 All right. Next. Then he says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed. Be thy name. Or, I believe the uh, uh, here it says, let your name be kept holy. May your name be kept holy. This is a reminder to us of God's great reliability. Everybody say reliability. Reliability. I was a little better. Y'all are waking up. <laughs> you see, well, you're like, well, wait a minute. How do you get reliability out of may your name be kept holy? What is his name? When, when, the I am that I am. When Moses stood before that burning bush and he said, Who are you and who should I say sent me? He said, You tell them that the I am that I am sent you. And as a matter of fact, in the Hebrew, it literally means the I am that 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 I am. And we can keep going. He is perpetual. When he says the I am that I am, Notice, Brother Joe, he didn't say the I am that, that was, or the I am that will be, or the I am that might be. No, he's the I am that I am. That means that I can, when I take hold of the promises that God has given me, I can rest on them, Sister Kim. They're sure, they're solid, they are foundational, Amen. that God's not going to wake up tomorrow morning. Well, he's kind of oxymoron since he doesn't sleep. But in the morning, God's not going to say, well, you know that blessing that I would heal you, Brother Chris? I changed my mind. <laughs> yeah, nah. That whole salvation thing, well, no. That was great for then, but I changed my mind. You know, as a matter of fact, you know, some people get this misunderstanding about, about Jesus and the work of the cross and how people were saved before Jesus came and how people have been saved afterwards. People have always been saved, either before the cross or after the cross. It's always been by the cross. Yeah. Before the cross, they looked forward to the time when the Messiah would come and would die in their place. And after the cross, we look backwards, and we know that he saved us by his grace, by the work of the cross. But it's always been, before the foundation of the world was laid, this was God's plan. Nothing surprises him. When you wake up and you have a crisis of faith, or when you have something that happens in your life and you don't know what's going on, you don't have to sit there and say, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do, because God already knows. And God's already seen it. Remember, folks, God is an eternity. A little physics for you here. Eternity means that right now, he sees everything that has happened, everything that is happening, and everything that will happen. Right now, he sees it, and he saw it a moment ago, too, and a moment ago. Because God is not limited to time and eternity like we are. He is beyond that. And he can look. And so when Ken looks down and he doesn't know how he's going to pay his bills tomorrow, it's not a sweat on God's brow because he can see it right now. And he already has seen it. He is the I am that I am. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when I pray, Hallowed be thy name. That is to remind me of how reliable he is. But there's another part to that that is really cool. The phrase, uh, the phrase that may your name be kept holy literally means in the Greek, it literally means may it always be lifted up in front of me. May it always be at eye level. Let your name 
always be at my eye's level. What does that mean? That means that when I wake up in the morning and I open my eyes, let my eyes see, my spiritual eyes see how reliable you are. When I start having doubt, remind me, Lord, in that moment, draw my eyes back. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, says that we should fix our eyes on Jesus solidly, the author, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. When I pray, hallowed be thy name, I am saying, Lord Jesus, keep your name in front of me today. When I'm going to the store and I see people there who are in desperate need, keep your name in front of me that I can offer them hope and life. But if your name is not right there, if I'm not focused on it, I'm going to miss it. So keep that name in front of me and keep the reliability of your name right at the forefront of my mind. His redemptive names, and, and there are a few... If you ever want to just really be blessed, you should do a study of the redemptive names of God in the Old Testament. His name is, he has many names, his redemptive names, Jehovah Rapha, my healer. It means that, Kyle, not only was he your healer, he is your healer, and he will be your healer. He is Jehovah Jireh. Brother Chris, he not only was your provider, he is your provider, and he will be your provider. And he's all of those things right now. Uh, he is my righteousness. Jehovah Tzikidnu. He is my righteousness. He was, he is, and he will be on my good days, on my bad days. Oh, this is good stuff. Y'all are being real quiet on me here. He is, oh, this is really good, Brother Thomas. He's Jehovah Shammah. The abiding one. He abides with me yesterday. He will abide with me today. And he will abide with me tomorrow. That's how I can walk securely. Lord, keep those names in front of me. That's what I'm praying when I pray. Hallowed be thy name. Let me keep your name holy. It means let me keep it right here in front of my eyes. Remind me of your consistency today. Oh, Jesus. He's Jehovah Nisi, my banner, the one who goes into battle before me, and he is my victory. He is Jehovah Shalom, my peace. He's my peace, Kelly. I don't have to worry. Next time the doctors call and say something's wrong with Kyle, take him back to the hospital, and all those thoughts of doubt come in, Michelle, you can go back and you can say, I have peace in knowing that everything is fine. He is Jehovah Mekedesh, Sister Diane. He is the Lord of the armies of hosts. He is the one who fights on my behalf. It means I don't have to do the fight. All I got to do is just step out of the way. If there's an army about to come through, the better thing for me to do is just get out of the way. Let them come do the fight for me. Oh, this is good stuff. I hope you all get this. Praise means to lift high and always be before me. It reminds us to treat his name as with, with holiness and with reference. He has an expectation of how we represent him and his name to others. Of course, we've always heard it that way, and that's true. And there's a whole lot of people out there who claim the name of Christ, who don't live the name of Christ. And also, it is to remind us to constantly keep his promises before us. Hebrews 12, 2 says that we should keep our eyes on Jesus. Then we pray, Lord, let your kingdom come. Now, in the New Living, it said, let your kingdom come soon. But this is actually slightly incorrect from how the Greek reads. The Greek phrase means, Lord, let your kingdom come now and let it be perpetually in my life. Amen. It is a personal thing. Remember that the disciples, they kept clamoring for the kingdom, right? They kept talking about Oh, I want to sit next to Jesus in the kingdom. Remember James and, 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 and uh, what was the other uh, brother? Uh, well, I can't remember the other one. The two, the two brothers who clamored to sit next to huh? James and John, the sons of Zebedee, that's right, sons of thunder, wanted to sit. Oh, Lord, when you come in your kingdom, let, let me sit on your right side and my, other, my brothers sit on your left side. Let, let, let that. But that's not what Jesus' kingdom is. You see, let your kingdom come 
reminds us of a responsibility that we have. Say responsibility. But I wasn't as strong in the last time. Let's try that one. Ready? Responsibility. That's a good job, boys and girls. We have a responsibility. It means let your kingdom come and let it be perpetually in my life. This is not an abstract prayer for God to set up some global kingdom on earth, for God to rule and reign from some capital city and for you to be in this cabinet of ministers. No. Instead, that is the misunderstanding of the Jews who are waiting on him as an earthly king, and quite frankly, it is a misunderstanding our Catholic friends have had with setting up the vicar of Rome as the pope, as the king of the church. I was talking with somebody yesterday on how they explain the idea that, well, the reason that the, the, the Pope gets to be bedecked with all that gold and all the pomp and all the circumstance and all that stuff is because, well, that's God's kingdom on earth. No. No. God's kingdom is different <laughs> from that. He's not our earthly kingdom. You see, the Word says, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, put that up for me, please, 417 of Matthew. He says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom is a spiritual kingdom yes. and the way one gains access to that Jesus. kingdom, it's right there. Jesus. It's the word repent. Mm. Now repentance is not a very popular Speak. word in churches any longer. As a matter of fact, you don't hear a lot about it. But repent simply means turn away yes. from your sins. Turn away from the way that you used to go, from your old way of thinking. So when I'm praying, Lord, let your kingdom come, what I'm saying is, Lord, help me today to do things differently than the way I did them before. Help me to turn around and start walking a different direction. I do the walking, though. I have a responsibility. I can't just sit there and say, let your kingdom come, and then I just sit there and wait. Okay, God, do all the work. Because <laughs> God's waiting on you. God says, you start going the other direction. Jeez. You start thinking differently. Jeez. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. One of our favorite, one of my favorite passages, once I understood it correctly. You know, we read this a lot of times in the King James, and it says, in the King James, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. That's not what it says. Look at it. Every one of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Period. Be baptized then because your sins have been forgiven. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and your children and even to the Gentiles and all who have been called to the Lord our God. What does that mean? How does it all start? It all starts with repent there, all right? It all starts with my changing the way I think. And it's not only the way that I think, it's the way I act, the way I talk, the way I behave. It's every part of me. Well, that's not easy to do. It will be the more you do it. And notice, it's let it begin today and let it be perpetual. It's not a one-time prayer. It's not a one-time that I'm just going to say, oh, okay, today I've repented. And 20 years from now, that's still fine. No, every day I get up and I say, Lord, today, crucify this flesh that I've got. Change my way of thinking today. Make me different, Lord, today. Less of me, more of you. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. All right, being quiet on me. Let your kingdom come acknowledges our re responsibility to allow the kingship or the lordship of Christ to reign in our lives. Yeah. How are we saved? How are we saved? You ask most evangelical Christians and they'll tell you, you need to ask Jesus to come into your heart. Show me that in this book. It's not in this book. There's no such thing in here of asking Jesus to come into my heart. There's no such thing in here that says, make Jesus your Savior. He is your Savior. But it's not what he's asking you to do to be saved. He says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, he says that we need to confess Jesus as our Lord, not as our Savior. Our Lord gets to tell us what to do. It's when I acknowledge the supremacy of his way instead of the supremacy of my way, that then he says, okay, that's it. <laughs> you recognize the thing that needs to be done. If I believe in my heart, if I confess, if I believe in my heart on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with my mouth him as my Lord, then I am saved. Amen. Then I am saved. But you've got to make him your Lord. Yes. 
Don't just make him some abstract savior of the world. He came to be in a personal relationship with you, and that is a lordly relationship. Finally, this morning, we're going to stop after this one. Let your will be done. Oh, this one's tough for a lot of people. Because you know what? What we usually want, you know what, you know what I usually want, Sister Deborah? I want it my way. Not your way. And not your way, and not your way, and not your way, and not your way, and not yours. Not anybody else's way. I want it my way. And when do I want it? Now. 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 Yesterday. <laughs> yes. You we saw that this morning. Do it. As a matter of fact, when we pray, he says, let your will be done. Right. Oh, that's a little reminder there. Keep it in front of my eyes, Jesus that I have to do, and what's our R-E word for this? It is our reminder to be renewed. Say that, renewed. Yeah. Oh, I have yeah. to work on it. Maybe by next week, it will be better. The reminder <laughs> to be renewed. Again, it's the same idea, not some abstract thing, but it's a personal thing. Lord, let it begin right now, and let it be perpetual. Constantly renew my mind. Change my stinking thinking. Amen. Did you know that the stuff that we think most of the time, and we think ourselves all high and mighty and all wonderful before God, most of the stuff we think God said is not what he said. You can find out what he said right here. You can find out what he said by getting on your knees and praying. But when I pray, I'm saying, God, renew my mind. That's how God's will begins to happen in my life. Well, well how is that, Brother Stan? Well, let's, let's talk about a couple of things. First of all, people have an incorrect understanding of God's will. I've heard people say, well, if it happened, it must have been God's will. Is that true? No. 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 Not everything which happens, not every minutia detail of our lives which occurs in our life is the will of God. Otherwise, we would have to say that Hurricane Katrina killing all those people, that that was God's will. Or we would have to say that AIDS was God's will. Or we would have to say a whole host of things, but those things all run contrary to what God says in his word. But no, you see, the idea that, that everything that happens is God's will is wrong. I can prove it to you from the Bible. Do you believe that it was God's will for Joseph to be thrown in a pit? I don't believe that. That was Joseph's doing. You see, God gave Joseph a dream, right? God gave Joseph a dream that one day all his brothers would bow down before him. Joseph was never told by God, go and tell your brothers. He was never told to go do that. But he had to go run his big old mouth, Brother Joe. One day, all of y'all are going to bow down before me. God <laughs> told me that. Well, off they went and, fell and threw him in a pit, sold him off into slavery. It wasn't God's will that, that, uh, that Potiphar's wife attempt to accuse him of rape. It wasn't God's will that he end up in prison. It wasn't all of those things were not God's will, but God took all of those things and said, now that might have not been my will, and that wasn't my will, and that wasn't my will for you either. But as long as you keep your eyes solidly on me, then I'm going to start taking all those things. I'm going to work them together and weave them together and work them into my divine will for you. Now, I promise you I'm, I'm wrapping up. You see... We need to make sure that we remember that we have free agency to choose in our lives whether we want to go God's way or not. You have a free choice today. Today you have a choice to take this sermon, which I'm preaching, and let it go in this ear and out the other ear. You have that choice today. Or you can have a choice to let it go in this ear and go straight to your heart and say, I accept this. Lord, change me. The choice is yours. We should constantly strive and search out and surrender to God's will in our lives. Put up Romans chapter 12, please. 12, 1 and 2. How do I do that? How do I know what God's will? Brother, Brother Spann, I, I don't know. I, I had a kid one time in children. How do I know what God's will? Well, he says right here. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Be a holy, let them be a living and holy sacrifice the kind he finds acceptable. This is the truly the way to worship him. Do not copy the behaviors and customs of this world.
but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You want to know God's will? Do those things. Do those things. It requires an act of renewal. It requires me to say, today I am not going to do what I used to do. I am not going to do what I want. I will do it his way. Okay, no more show tunes. <laughs> Well, well what, what do you mean to change the way I think? What should we think about? Philippians 4.8 says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me, everything you have heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of all peace will be with you. How do I change the way I think? Start thinking about some other things. You know, all the trials we've gone through as a people, as individuals, there is a choice that we have to make, isn't there, Sister Deborah? We can sit there and we can look at those things, Kim, and we can say, that's what I'm going to fix my attention on. That's what I'm going to talk about. The things which are bad things which are of an ill report, the things which are contrary, the things which are not pure, the things which are evil. And I'm going to talk about those things. I'm going to go over to Tara. Tara, did you hear of, did you hear about Brother Joe? Let me tell you about Brother Joe. Brother Joe did, and then we just that, all, we let it all out. It's not what God says to think about. God says to think about the things which are honest which are pure, which are lovely, which are admirable, which are of a good report. You know what? The way you think, the way you'll speak. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I want to ask you, what's in your heart today? This morning as we wrap up, this morning as we conclude, I just want to encourage you today to make a time where you commit to prayer. I, I just, I really don't know how else to emphasize this to you, to everyone here. Everything we do in our lives, this is much bigger than just the scope of the mission of Gateway of Hope Church. This is what will make you succeed in your Christian walk or fail in your Christian walk. You cannot expect your pastor to do all the praying. You can't expect just to have the prayer chain go to town for you when a need comes up. You must have that personal commitment and a time daily when you get on your face before God and you say, this is what I have need of. Jesus, today, I worship you. I remember who you are. You are my beloved Father. I remember my relationship. Today, I know you're reliable and I can take you up on your promises. Today, I know my responsibility. My responsibility is to submit to your Lordship. And today, I will be renewed in my mind. I will change the way that I think. Father, this morning as we conclude, Father God, this time in your word, we're asking you, Jesus, to, I'm asking you, Jesus, specifically, God, to touch our folks and to lay in them, God, the need, Lord Jesus, to pray and to pray with fervency. Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to raise up an army, an army of people who know how to find you in your presence. Lord, when people speak of this church, let them always say that is a church that knows how to pray. In the name of Jesus. Would you stand with me this morning? And just would you close?
Shed for 